Um, welcome to uh, Healthier Dancers, Dancing Better. Um, we're focusing on this session in evidence-based practice. So uh, these webinars are presented by the National Institute of Dance Medicine and Science. And the National Institute is an organization which aims to enhance dance students and professionals' health, well-being, and performance through access to high quality dance science knowledge, evidence-based practice, and better, more affordable access to first-class dance-specific healthcare and dance science support services, both in private practice and in the NHS across the UK. NIDAMS is a network of multidisciplinary partners, including Birmingham Royal Ballet, the University of Wolverhampton, the University of Birmingham, One Dance UK, Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance, and the Royal Ballet. Our partners are represented by Professor Emma Redding, Dr. Nick Allen, Professor Matthew Wyan, Professor Joan Duda, Dr. Roger Woolman, and our speaker today, Shane Kelly. So today's session is the first in a series of educational workshops for the National Institute of Dance Medicine and Science. And our focus with these sessions is to provide ongoing opportunities to share best practice, discuss current issues, and keep up to date with emerging, emerging clinical practice and research in dance medicine and science and dancers' health. For those of you working with dancers or students, a series of sessions focused on building back to dancing at your best will begin next Tuesday. This three-part series will feature a mini SNC training session, guidance on healthy nutrition for dance, and key tips for injury care. Um, if you are interested in any of these sessions, please do contact manager at onedanceuk.org to be added to the mailing list. Um, just to finish up my tiny little beginning here, just a bit of housekeeping for you. So um, the totality of the webinar today will be one hour. And for the first 40 minutes, we will have the presentation from Shane, and then we will move on to a question and answer session. So within that question and answer session, please do feel free to put any questions into the chat box or into the Q&A box. If you use the Q&A box, you are able to ask questions anonymously. Um, and you can also upvote questions that you see in the Q&A box if you'd like to hear the answer to that question as well. So I am all done with all the things I had to say. So now I'm going to pass you over to Shane to hear a little bit more about evidence-based practice at the Royal Ballet. Well, thank you, Aaron. Aaron, thank you for the introduction and thanks for setting the scene. I'm, <clears throat> I can't see any faces, which is really sad because I like to see faces when I talk, but I can see some names and there are some names in the list uh, I, I recognize. So hopefully <laughs> I do this next 40 minutes justice. I'm just gonna share my screen now and uh, bear with me while I do that. And Erin, do you want to let me know, is that the proper view again? So you'll just need to put it into full screen, I think. Yeah. Is that, is that better? There you go. And I'll try cool. and make it so you can see more people's faces. Yeah, no, that's it. Okay, thank you. Just going back a slide, just checking that the, um, the clicker works. All right. Uh, Yes, good, after, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming along this Wednesday at three o'clock. I know sometimes at this time we can all start to hit a bit of a bump in the afternoon, but I try and, I'm going to try and make it interesting for you this next 40 minutes or so. Uh, I, I know it's, uh, I just want to thank Erin for a, a great opportunity to be able to speak on evidence-based practice in professional ballet. And certainly looking through the list of attendees today, I'm sure all of you have a good grasp of the concept, but uh, I think it's always good to review um, what, what do we mean by evidence-based practice and, and certainly how, how do we apply it best in professional ballet, because certainly the, you know, the, the evidence is still sort of developing for context specific uh, research in, in, in certain parts of what we do. Um, I just want to, before I start, I want to give you a bit of history about myself, because I, I do think it's important. It's not, not necessarily talk about myself, but I think it's relevant to the topic today. And that was it, is that I, I came from British athletics. Um, I've only been with the ballet and I've only been in the dance world for about the past 12 months 
12 to 18 months. Um, but yeah, before that, I was with uh, high level athletics, working with Olympic uh, track, and, Olympic level track and field athletes. And, you know, I worked with British athletics for 10 years. I worked with the Australian athletics uh, Olympic side of things for five years before that. So in all, I was 15 years at the, the highest level of, of track and field, did three Olympic cycles. And I appreciate what, what performance means in that level within sport. And I'm not, I'm definitely not saying today that uh, track and field athletes are like dancers. In fact, they are quite different, you know, from the physical point of view, psychological, creative demand, and the culture of the sports and the environments we work in. But the one thing I wanted to try and highlight is that when it comes to evidence-based practice, the principles are still the same, whether they are in athletics or in ballet. And I hope, you know, and I hope to sort of demonstrate that over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, so as I, as I said, I, I am a physio and a manager as well now. Uh, so I, I, my role as a physio is to be clinical director of the Royal Ballet now. Um, everything I want to implement as a clinical director has to have some form of authority and accountability behind it. And that authority and accountability for me comes through scientific uh, evidence and research and evidence-based practice. It, it is my job uh, as the leader of an elite performance medicine clinic to be completely responsible and accountable for the health of the dancers of the company. And therefore, as a practitioner, I must, everything we do as a team and everything I do as a practitioner must have evidence and efficacy behind it. So the responsibility applies in any setting, whether that's in sport or dance. And, uh, and there is absolutely a role for evidence-based practice, both in athletics and in, <clears throat> and in, and in dance, and I just wanted to say that finally, with, with, with our team, with that in mind, we, we apply and use a multidisciplinary team here at Ballet Healthcare, much like we did in athletics. There was a multidisciplinary team around our, our dancers, uh, sorry, our athletes, and there is a multidisciplinary team around our dancers here, and we're, we're lucky enough to have the resources to be able to do that. So what about today then? Firstly, I'm going to start with a little bit of a review of what is evidence-based practice. I'm going to talk about how we implement evidence-based practice, both theoretically and, in, and, and give examples for, from Ballet Healthcare, how that's done. And then finally, some further examples uh, from Ballet Healthcare regarding case studies and research we've been able to develop here. Um, when, just because uh, I am a physio by trade, when I'm talking about evidence-based practice for the benefit of this presentation today, I'll, I'll probably use evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine interchangeably. Uh, I think, you know, the, all of these principles apply, whether you're a SNC coach, psychologist, physiologist, dietitian, doctor, we all employ evidence-based principles. Most of these uh, disciplines evolve in the health scientists. So, you know, whether you're a teacher or a leader or manager as well, evidence-based principles uh, apply across the board. But for today, I'm gonna use evidence-based medicine as the sort of, to highlight the, the principles I'm referring to. So what is evidence-based practice? Well, in, in the medicine context, evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit and judicious, judicious use of current evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. The practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. And this was a definition proposed by Sackett back in 1996. And I remember first hearing this when I was in undergrad, way back in the early 2000s, when I was a young physio and, and learning my trade. And this was drilled into us while we were at school back then. And as you can see, the definition stems from 1996, so evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practice is not a new concept. It's probably been around for 20 or 30 years. I think just in, uh, in, in reality, it just does take long, uh, a long time for research to translate into practice. And you probably see that reflected uh, a few times through this presentation today. 
pulling, focusing in on certain aspects of the definition of evidence-based medicine is, was, is these highlighted areas. And I want to focus on these just a little bit more. But there are three pillars to evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice. It's they all talk about the current best evidence. They all talk about the care of individual patients. And there is a requirement that you use your own clinical expertise and experience as well. So let's talk about these ones individually. So when we're talking about the individual or the patient in front of you or the dancer that in front of you, one of the pillars of evidence-based medicine is, is so crucial. It's so important to have good relationships and to respect the values and expectations of the dancer that's in front of you. Uh, if you don't identify with that patient quickly, whether you're a practitioner or a manager, you, you're kind of finished. And I, could, I, and, he, and I can't take my values as, and, and beliefs as a practitioner from athletics and just translate them into dance that's never going to work and never is, never could I just see one dancer and then expect to know them all. I think for every situation in our work, we need to respect the person or the group of people that are in front of us and apply and recognize their values and expectations. And by doing this, we'll have a far greater chance of success in terms of our outcomes for our patients. Second pillar of evidence-based medicine is clinical expertise you, you all, are all fantastic and brilliant clinicians in your own right. You all have different levels of experience uh, along the way. You all have something to offer, but it is not necessarily the only thing as, as this model suggests. It is one part of, of the picture. And certainly there are times where let's say the latest research isn't available and all you've got is your clinical expertise. And it's completely appropriate in that time to use your experience, to use your expertise, to use the expertise of your colleagues around you to come up with the solutions and outcomes that your patients need. But equally, if there is something from a research perspective that's out there, it is our responsibility as managers, as leaders, as high performing practitioners to keep abreast of the latest research. And, and with those three, these three elements, we hope to increase our outcomes for our patients. I know when it comes to accessing the latest research, the third pillar of evidence-based practice, it can be hard. You know, there are barriers sometimes to accessing uh, evidence-based medicine or, or scientific research in other areas. Um, and because of either the need to pay for it, or it's just difficult, you have to go through an academic institution. But I do think we live in the information age and more and more, we see the latest research becoming open access or people releasing evidence for free. And I think that's a really good thing. And it's a changing, it's a changing uh, topic. And I think, you know, if you want one quick thing is that always a little tip from me is that Google Scholar actually does really well in terms of uh, having evidence at your fingertips. Generally, Google Scholar will try and offer as much free or open access research and the search engines used in Google Scholar are really effective too. So, you know, in this day and age, there's almost no excuse for not looking for looking for research. It's certainly out there. Some of it's free. And I think, again, if you respect these three pillars as a practitioner or a leader, you're well on the way to adopting and understanding what evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice is all about. Barriers. I think for everyone here today, it's, a, it's, it's uh, important to, to appreciate the barriers that, that are there in front of us. Uh, it's not easy being a manager, it's not easy being a, a practitioner, but in, in um, identifying the barriers to evidence-based practice, we have a chance of really making it a thing and really implementing it in the places we work. A recent systematic review done by Fruth 2010, it's probably not that recent actually, it's 10 years ago, but a systematic review by Fruth 10 years ago found that at least amongst physical therapists, these were very common barriers to what that, to the implementation of evidence-based practice. Often we talk about scarce resources, not, we're not interested, the science doesn't apply in my setting, lack of time, inability to understand statistics, or the lack of, lack of support from our employer. Now I'm sure some of us here today listening have come up against one or 
a range of these barriers in terms of implementing best practice in your environment. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, recently I came back from the IOC uh, medical conference, which was on the weekend, and uh, the IOC medical conference, at least in sport, is seen as the best, highest level sports injury and illness prevention conference that, that goes around. Uh, it would be, you know, much like iAdams has their annual or biannual conference on, on dance and injury prevention. That's seen as the main, main and best one. The IOC injury and injury illness conference is also the best, seen as the best one in sport. And the, one of the key messages I got from the weekend was a thing around implementation and implementation science. And one of the, one of the main, there's lots of models and, and uh, suggestions of how to help implement best practice in your environment. But over and over again, the models come back to identifying barriers within your environment to help you implement best practice where you are. So you might sit back as a manager and I've tried to represent this schematically and say, you know, these are the barriers here, time, support, stats, do I know resources or, you know, it doesn't apply to me and we all have them. You all have them in different levels. You know, you, you might work in an environment where you have high resources, but low support and your time, well, it's equivocal, it's there, but you have to book it out. But I think as managers, we have a duty to sit back and give space and spot these, spot these, uh, spot these barriers because without taking that, you know, step back and that external view, that big picture view of things and not tackling some of these barriers head on, you can be the best leader, the best practitioner, the best manager. But if you don't hit the barriers and, and start breaking them down, your, your injury and illness prevention and practice is just not going to get through and you're going to be, all you're going to do is end up frustrated and your, your patient outcomes aren't going to improve either. So it is important to recognize uh, our barriers to ensure, improve the chances of success. Okay, so the process. What about evidence-based practice? Okay, so you've identified your barriers, you know what it is, you're completely on board with evidence-based practice, you wanna get going, you're inspired by me and my talk today, you know, great, let's, let's crack on and let's, uh, let's start doing evidence-based medicine where I work now. Um, Sackett, again, uh, one of the early proponents of evidence-based medicine, at least, described this process of how to implement it in your, in your work environments. So starting at the top, first of all, you convert your clinical problems or your information needs into answerable questions. Number two, you track down with maximum efficiency the best of it, evidence with which to answer them whether from clinical examination, the diagnostic lab, research evidence, or other sources. Next, you critically appraise that evidence for its validity and usefulness. Third, fourth, sorry, you integrate this appraisal with your clinical expertise. And then finally, you evaluate your own performance. And I think most of us here as well today would agree with uh, the use of reflective practice in, in our daily practice. So, that, that's evidence-based practice, that's the process. And I wanna really focus on <clears throat> the first aspect, which is number one, which I think is probably the first and most important aspect of evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine is converting your clinical or daily problems or information needs into answerable questions. If you're not asking the right questions as a practitioner or as a leader, or as a manager, then you are gonna end up <laughs> You, you're, you're possibly going to continue to remain in the dark. Richardson and others in 1995 suggested that, you know, at least in a clinical or medical setting, these were just six broad categories where our questions tended to lie. As therapists or medical Shane, I just lost the sound for you. Did everybody else?
Hello. There we go. Definitely can hear you now. Everybody else? Good. Thanks. Are we still there? Yeah, I'll still here. Just lost the sound for a sec. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. We can hear you, but it might be that you don't hear us. I can hear you, Erin. Ah, fantastic. Okay, good. Yeah, we can hear you now. It's all good. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. It might have to do with the headphones. I'll, I'll crack on. So, um, as we're talking about, Richardson and others thought that um, formulating a question, a clinical question, fell into these six broad categories. And so to, again, highlight what sort of questions we might get as a practitioner, I'll, I'll probably run through some of these now as examples. So what you might see is, uh, sorry, oh, here he is catching up. When, we, when it comes down to clinical evidence, we might get how many injuries do my dancers get? That's quite a common question. I'm sure you guys have all had at some stage during your, your as time as a practitioner or a leader. Diagnosis, should I MRI this dancer with pain over their fibula bone? That's, that's an example of a clinically oriented question you know, or, or an information need. Prognosis, when's it safe to advise the dancer to get back on stage? That's again, an, another example of a question that we may need to answer through evidence-based and through research. Therapy-related questions. Are painkillers appropriate for this tendinopathy? Again, it's a time to maybe go out there and do the literature search on whether, whether painkillers are appropriate. Prevention. Is it worth screening my dancers at the start of a ballet season? I'm sure we've all answered that question at some point. And then finally, education. I know I want to do calf races for, before classes with my dancers, but how can I get the dancers on board? So again, talking about the evidence-based process, talking about step number one, formulating the right clinical questions. These are the question categories that they tend to fall in. And these are some of the questions that you might try and answer yourself through evidence-based medicine, through applying those three pillars in your daily practice. So that's the concept and process and definition of evidence-based practice. So then how do we do it at Ballet Healthcare? How is it tied into what we do as a team? Well, firstly, I'll, I'll just leave this up for a minute and we'll read through the Ballet Healthcare vision and mission. The Ballet Healthcare vision and mission is to be a world pioneering interdisciplinary team providing holistic service in a dancer-focused, performance-led environment. The mission is to support every dancer to fulfill their potential and achieve a healthy and long-lasting career. This will be delivered through ethical and evidence-based, there's that word, education from multidisciplinary healthcare team. And I've highlighted the word evidence-based here for obvious reasons. So, you asked, I asked, I put the question to you at the start, how do we implement evidence-based practice uh, within, within your setting? Well, I believe it can start with just the individual or the practitioner, but possibly the better place to start is that it starts from the top. And then it starts from management, starts from leadership, and it starts from a team effort to recognize that evidence-based intervention is an important aspect of the way you work. And we think so much so at Ballet Healthcare that we've got it written into our vision and mission. And if you ever come into Ballet Healthcare at the Royal Opera House, the vision and mission are up on two plaques in, in front of one of our rehearsal studios and the vision and mission are there for everyone to see. So we very much try and walk the talk here at Ballet Healthcare when it comes to evidence-based interventions. Ballet Healthcare Clinical Governance Framework, again, how can we further as managers and leaders integrate evidence-based practice into our care? Well, this is straight from our governance framework uh, from Ballet Healthcare. We have six pillars of clinical governance and they are risk assessment, clinical audit, education and training, evidence-based care and effectiveness, patient care experience and staff and staff management. Again, there it is, evidence-based care and effectiveness. So it's our, within our vision and mission, 
and it's within our clinical governance framework. This is the thing that we operate, we use to set the standard and framework as, an, as a department on how we operate and how we keep ourselves accountable and how we protect standards of patient care. Lastly, we have the Ballet Healthcare Strategic Objectives. And the strategic objectives are, as they're, as they're written here, to reduce injury and illness impact, to enhance dancer performance, to have robust and transparent clinical governance, external presence and collaboration, and engagement with dancers and artistic and ballet staff. So where does evidence-based practice fit into our strategic objectives? Well, I'll quickly go through it now. Firstly, when it comes to injury and illness impact, Everything we do regarding injury and illness surveillance, injury prevention, injury management is all based in the evidence-based medicine paradigms. So everything we try and implement here has probably come from research that's out there or stuff that we've created ourselves. Enhancing dancer performance, whether that's the biomechanics of jumping, s &C programming, recovery practices, load monitoring. Again, it's either from empirical research that's being done by others or it's stuff that we've done ourselves. Robust, transparent clinical governance. As we've just seen, it's about a multidisciplinary team. It's about the effectiveness and safety of our interventions. And it's, and it's also about organizational management practices. Everything we do within our governance framework is evidence-based as much as possible. External presence and collaboration. We want to share knowledge, share skills, do our own research and have professional relationships with people and organizations that you know, work within and generate and, and are willing to share evidence-based practice where they are, which is probably why we're here today. And then finally, engagement with dancers, artistic staff and ballet staff is evidence-based elements through all of this, whether that's maintaining the mental health of our dancers, the, the use of language and how we communicate with our stakeholders, and then yet again, this thing around implementation in terms of dropping down the barriers to progress and transformation within our setups. So from our vision and mission, from our governance framework, from our strategy, we live and breathe evidence-based medicine and it's threaded through everything we do. At the coal face, this is what we're left with. And I've referred to this right at the start, and this is a multidisciplinary healthcare model. And the multidisciplinary model is, uh, is as, it's, as you see here, hope, I'm not sure what everyone's set up is where they work here today. It'd be interesting to explore that in the discussion. But within Ballet Healthcare, to let you know the setup that we, we are able to have is that we have the dancer in the middle, we have a therapy, therapy support for all our dancers, whether that's physiotherapy or soft tissue. We have medical support with, with, we have medical support through our doctor who comes in once a week. We have nutrition support once a fortnight, but on call as well. Psychology, psychological support on call, S and C support on a daily basis for our dancers. And we have coaching. What, what's the benefits of the multidisciplinary model? Well, the reason why we, we've probably gone with it is you know, that it's been, it has been taken from other healthcare settings, but, but it's a recognition that injury and health and performance are complicated elements. And they're also multifactorial elements and no one practitioner or no one person probably knows it all. And if you can create an environment where all these specialists can work in harmony, then you're going to be, have a far greater chance of success of solving a dancer's issues, injury and health issues through the multidisciplinary healthcare model. As I said, it has been ripped from other spheres, mainly from public health. Um, but in recent times, particularly in the last 10 to, 10 to 20 years, sport has tried to take that multidisciplinary model and apply it in, our, in their setting. And there's no reason why that can't be exactly translated yet again to dance. So whenever I'm presenting, again, these sorts of models and research that come from sport, it's 100% applicable in dance, in my opinion. What I've got in front of you here is uh, uh, a group of papers and authors that have taken the model a bit, little bit further. And it's not just about having a multidisciplinary team, 
but here they talk about having an integrated coach, uh, sorry, an integrated approach to performance and health management within your setups. And this really is the panacea and the gold standard of what we need to be aiming for, in my opinion, in terms of a dancer healthcare setting, where you don't just have the multidisciplinary team looking after the dancer, but you have integration between the company management and the artistic staff, and all are on all, all, all stakeholders are equal. And when it comes to dancer health and performance management, decisions are made collaboratively and with shared weighting. And ideally, they're made together, empowering the athlete, empowering the artistic staff, and, and also while, while respecting first principles of medical and therapy management to, again, have better results, long-term, better relationships between healthcare staff, artistic staff, and the dancers. So there is a swathe of evidence and models out there from uh, sports. I've just picked out two of them. These are some of the more commonly quoted papers from sport, Dijkstra and others in 2015, and then Spora and Wint in 2018. Dijkstra talked about their experiences in athletics. So this was uh, written by a couple of ex-colleagues of mine, where you have elements of science, medicine and therapy, performance health management and coaching all overlapping. Everyone has their individual roles, very clear, but what this model shows is an overlapping and shared responsibility. Equally, Spora and Wint's model is much the same. Athletes, artistic staff, you could say here, a therapy lead, a multidisciplinary team around them, all with shared responsibility, all pulling in the same direction, shared goals, shared decision-making. This is the current gold standard management of, of dance, of, of athletes, but should also, could also be dancers uh, currently being espoused and enacted in uh, sports clubs and organizations at the highest level. So then in practice, what does it mean? And I think probably the best way to show you, rather than talking about models and theories and research, is to sort of take you through a case study that we've had here at Ballet Healthcare. <clears throat> and um, this is a real case. That is not the real dancer. Uh, but this is a real case of, of someone that's come through our clinic. So we'll talk about their history briefly. They've obviously given permission for me to speak around their case. We've got an 18 year old dancer, first year in the company, has bilateral shin pain, uh, left greater than right, has a three week history of worsening pain, has had recently a busy rehearsal schedule and performance schedule, has pain at the end of the day, has pain at night, does smoke, is vegan, has irregular periods, and also has a history of bone pain and stress. Now, I know some of you in the audience today have a clinical background, and if you're reading that history, your mind is probably racing right now, and little red lights are pinging all over the place, and you're thinking, wow, we've got a, a case on our hands here. Through the multidisciplinary approach and through clinical reasoning, all aspects of uh, evidence-based practice, you run through your differ differential diagnosis. It could be medial tibial bone stress. It could be a bone stress response. It could be a stress fracture. It could be compartment syndrome. And or you need to consider at this point the, uh, the influence of relative energy deficiency syndrome or REDS. So here we are. We've got, our, we've got our dancer in front of us. We've got our set of problems, as we talked about, going back to Sackett, line one, problem. What's our problem at the moment? How, how are we going to solve this as a team? Well, this is where we start to gather around the dancer, and this is how it works in ballet healthcare when everything runs smooth. We have a dancer with an issue in front of us. Once it's identified as an injury issue, we'll normally have the multidisciplinary team get around a table with, with the dancer within the first couple of days and we'll sit down with the dancer and we'll go through diagnosis, prognosis, shared goals, shared decision making, and obviously try and outline a plan in those first few days and weeks. Also from the start, we'll bring in people like, uh, you know, other people, not just medicine therapy, people from the sciences, performance health management, coaching, artistic staff and management. 
So again, within those first few days, we have the healthcare team, the dancer, and everyone else on the same page in, to, in, in terms of prognosis, diagnosis, a plan, and shared goals for that dancer. This is an example of evidence-based management. So what do we want to do if we want to take it further? You know, for, to, to highlight this further in terms of our evidence-based management, what might we do in this early phase? I know some of you are probably thinking, well, how would you, how would you help? How would you tackle some of the issues surrounding this dancer in the first stop? So to do that in an evidence-based fashion, I've just given some broad headings of things that we would consider and, and, have, and did do with this dancer in those first few days and weeks. If we focus, if we're bringing the doctor in at this point, evidence-based interventions and assessment, assessments used with this, with this dancer at the time, MRI was brought in very early as the gold standard of imaging for, for, for bone pathology. Blood tests were done in terms of uh, relationship to REDS. There was a REDS questionnaire. REDS questionnaires, there are a few out there at the moment which are validated reliable tools in a dance setting. Again, evidence-based practice and smoking. Well, everyone knows the evidence behind that. Physio, load management, big topic, buzzword. Some people hate it, but it is real. It is a thing. And we have to have an understanding of the dancer's training load or rehearsal schedule at the time. And how do we appropriately manage this dancer's load once they've come to us in the sort of pain state they were in? In this particular instance, our decision was to stop the dancer dancing and all other sort of impact activity for two weeks straight up. So that was the decision firstly that we took straight away. And in that time, we used it to do neuromuscular exercise, manual therapy, and other forms of clinical assessment like handheld dynamometry, balance, uh, some uh, strength diagnostic type, type activity, all again coming from evidence-based back with our own clinical experience to help evaluate where exactly this dance was at. Nutrition, evidence-based interventions and assessments were a bit D assessment and calcium, again, bloods would inform that. And but you know supplementation if if needed, bioavailability of macro and micronutrients in particular protein, you know for to support the dancers, a comeback from this sort of injury, there needs to be good musculoskeletal health and support and bioavailability and a good environment for healing and recovery. Protein being a big part of that, and uh, as a vegan she was always going to struggle. So how would we overcome that and how do we help her address that? Coaching and artistic management, as I said, part of the performance team brought in early, even though they don't have any direct input with the dancer, they definitely have some verbal input. We need to know what sort of role the dancer is going to have to come back to. We need to know the physical requirements of that role. We need the coaches and artistic staff to have input and buy in from the start and go through that journey with the dancer and not just expect to see them at the end where they're fit and healthy again. Psychology, finally, knowing that this is possibly going to be a longer term, longish term injury. You know, we need to look after the well-being of the dancer. We need to deal with their anxieties of perhaps not performing or missing rehearsal or missing performances. There has to be an element recognizing the psychology. And if there was anything that we needed to do regarding return to performance, there might be an additional clinical interventions as well. So going around the multidisciplinary team, going around what you know, it's a relatively common presentation in dance. You can see it's a relatively common presentation, but with a complex, a range, a complex range of issues and potential inputs, but all very specific to the person that's in the middle of this picture. This is, in essence, evidence-based medicine in practice. This is a model I've stolen, well, I've borrowed, adapted, you could say, from athletics. We used to use it in terms of... Um, the next phases and how we plan rehab. There's been lots and lots of research in recent years uh, on return to play phases and objective return to play criterion. And this is just a very generic model which takes you from the diagnosis through the rehab into training and then back to full fitness and performance. Whatever tests you use at each stage and interventions are completely your choice. But the idea is that everything you do use, whether that's testing or interventions, is evidence-based. And also this model sort of suggests that uh, 
the emphasis of who delivers what changes over time. So at the start, diagnosis and prognosis is very much in the medical sphere. Shift less is needed from the doc, less is needed in your own setting but return to play there you go sounds like she might be back so um finally when it's time to let the dancer go again you know we all wrestle with this process and yet again, the evidence and research has come to the rescue a little bit in this area. And so that just as there's been lots of uh, models and research on dancer management or athlete management, just as there's been lots of research on return to play, there's been also lots of research in this final stage in terms of making that decision of when the time is right. And this is one by Schreier and all, it's called the Start Framework. I like it because it has the level of detail that's probably required in terms of the questions and things that you need to tick off before allowing a dancer or an athlete back onto the stage or back onto the pitch. And also it just respects the sort of three main areas of tissue health, tissue stresses and risk, risk tolerance. But if we look at some of these things here, there is a lot of things that you wanna tick as a practitioner before you're feeling com confident and comfortable uh, that the dancer's ready to uh, get back on stage. So when it came to this dancer, particularly our case study, these are the things that we wanted to see uh, before the dancer was you know, deemed to be like, have a full and safe return in, in our eyes. So we wanted to see no pain of, no pain with activities of daily living or dance. We wanted full ankle range of motion, passive, passive range of motion, active range of motion. We wanted calf endurance, you know, calf capacity, left equals right. We wanted their jump scores on the, on the force plates to be within 10% of each other, left to right. We want their bloods to have normalized by the end of their rehab. We want them to be, you know, not flagging up anything from their red screening by the end of their rehab. Psych assessment says they're ready to perform again. We've got completion of a return to jump protocol, full completion of class, full completion of rehearsal. The dancer says that they're ready and they, they've achieved all the goals they wanted to. And finally, we, you know, not important for getting back on stage 100%, nothing we will hold them back from, but certainly things we might have liked to have seen a change over the time is some dietary changes and changes in smoking. Habits. So this, if we achieved it all, I think would be a successful rehab, you know, box it off, tick it off, great, we've done a great job. But, but, but then we've got the other part of, of letting the dancer go and allowing them to go back on stage and seeing it all stick. Sometimes it sticks, sometimes it doesn't, but this just shows you the level of detail and scrutiny that you might need to get the dancer back from something like a bone stress, which is, again, somewhat routine uh, in, in our environment. Finally, I'm gonna go through a little bit of creating your own evidence. And in ballet healthcare, we have the fortunate situation of being associated with St. Mary's University. We have a strong research ethic and arm um, within our department. We, we invest in it from a money and time point of view and a manpower point of view. And we have people within our setup that are able to do research internally and also do it to a level, you know, a high academic level where, you know, people are getting PhDs and publications off the back of it. So not every healthcare setup is able to do that. And, you know, but you can still, as practitioners, wherever you work, employ the, practice, the principles of evidence-based practice, and you can do your own research. And it's, and it's probably from a work 
uh, that I'm going to show you in a minute that you can base some of your decisions and, and where you need to perhaps be focusing on. But I put the challenge in, to you all that evidence-based practice and, and creating your own research is possible within your own settings. And, and you may need to choose where you focus on. For us at Ballet Healthcare, four or five years ago, the areas we needed to focus on were injury surveillance and load monitoring. We didn't know enough around the injuries that were specifically happening in our cohort, nor did we know enough about the specific load requirements and training and dance load requirements of, of our dancers at the Royal Opera House. So we needed to answer those questions and we needed to answer, and we wanted to answer them at a really high level. We wanted to know, we wanted to have something to hang our hat on and something to base our injury prevention and Ill, injury illness um, strategies towards. So off the back of these, you know, again, process, problem needs, going back to the second definition, what sort of questions were we able to answer uh, through our own research? So when we try to answer the question about what injuries do we have in our own court, cohort, Adam Matusi, which is one of our staff members, plus a, a bunch of our others, managed to do a five-year study on, on injuries in an elite, in a professional ballet company, obviously the Royal Ballet, five years of injuries, talking about medical attention injuries and time loss. This was such a detailed piece of work, and it was an amazing piece of work. It made the British uh, Journal of Sports Medicine, being a dance article, um, was an amazing achievement. And if you haven't seen this, I do implore you to go and read it because in terms of sort of knowing where, where, where and what injuries occur in ballet, it's a, it's a fairly good start. When we talk about the question of in our setting, what, what are the workload demands of our ballet, of, of ballet dancers generally? You know, this was done again by one of our team, Joseph Shaw, who's done a systematic review of the demands of professional ballet. We ask the question sometimes, how, how can we measure dancer load in our cohort? Well, we, we, we answered it through doing this paper, the validity of session RPE in, in the use of professional cl classical ballet dancers. And then finally, the demands of our schedule. What are the demands of our schedule at the Royal Ballet? And again, we're able to, through the work of Joseph Shaw, be able to answer that question, looking over five seasons uh, retrospectively of, of dance, dance analysis. And then finally as well, how that dance workload related to injury risk. So we were able in our setting to answer some pretty key questions for our cohort. But again, I think anyone can do that as long as you have the time. But it, and it doesn't have to be to, a, to an academic or publication standard. A lot of good work goes on in day-to-day -day elite performance settings that doesn't get that sort of recognition. But when it does come out, it, it, is, it is good to see. But please, I, I'd uh, set the challenge to you guys to try and uh, replicate some of that type of work, perhaps in some small way in your setting. Really to summarize then, Evidence-based practice for me is vital to comp contemporary management of a ballet company or school. Evidence-based practice is not just about generating research, it's about your clinical expertise and the dancer values, and I would give equal weighting to all of those three. Evidence-based practice is a great place to start to answer your daily questions, and hopefully you've seen some examples of questions we've tried to answer at Ballet Healthcare, but hopefully they're, they're probably questions that you've asked of yourself at times. Build evidence-based practice into your structure and strategy so it becomes second nature. And I hope I've demonstrated how we've tried to build evidence-based practice into the, into the structures and systems that we have here at Ballet Healthcare. And finally, start practicing evidence-based straight away. I'm sure some of you already are, and, and, it's, and it's amazing, but it, it is a constant process of refining, you know, identifying barriers, breaking down those barriers, and keep on pressing. And so hopefully I've given you a little bit more motivation to, to, to press on with evidence-based practice. If you've been thinking about an illness or injury prevention measure, then go on and do it. Give it the time, sit back, identify the barriers, keep pressing, keep learning, and keep doing it for the benefit of your dancer group. I hope that that's it for today. And I'm really happy and, and open to 
here's some questions if you have them and hopefully you all haven't fallen asleep uh, at this point in the afternoon. <laughs> 